Thanks very much. Um, very pleased to be here. It's been a really rewarding day for me, I'm, I have to say. Um, so the concept of the food map, um, essentially we're looking at, as a starting point at least, we were looking at a web accessible catalog of all the food related research that was going on at the University of Guelph. And food at the University of Guelph is a street strategic priority. It's one of our main um, areas of focus in terms of academic research. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is to take the accomplishments of academic research out of the ivory tower and expose it to the public, private industry, media, um, anyone who might um, see value in the research that's, that's going on. We want to broker relationships between those with a need for innovative solutions and those with the expertise to develop those solutions. And out of these connections, we believe that it, it will give birth to new knowledge. So I'm going to start by um, giving you a brief uh, video, just a, a minute or two um, video. Um, the food map comes from a partnership between uh, the library at the University of Guelph and the Food Institute. It was initially the vision of Ricky Yada, who was at the University of Guelph and is now at UBC. Um, he sort of passed the mantle on to Renee Van Acker, and the video is going to feature Renee Van Acker just talking a little bit about the nature of the food map. The food map is intended to be a tool to connect researchers to uh, the industry and to connect the industry to researchers and to allow the industry to solve problems and grow their business. To provide an example of how the food map uh, has been used uh, successfully, um, we had a company approach us last fall. They used the food map, they searched and they were able to find uh, a researcher here at the University of Guelph who was working on exactly the issue they were dealing with. Uh, the food map uh, gives them contact information, so they contacted the researcher and they're in discussions with that researcher about you know, how they might use uh, his results and, and also how they might uh, engage in a research collaboration. We're very interested in uh, partnerships and so we're looking for organizations and individuals that are interested in, in talking to us and perhaps working with us on expanding the food map and becoming part of the food map. I think there's lots of exciting potential in how it can help uh, the sector grow uh, and we're looking for those partnerships. So this gives you a little um perspective on what the food map looks like in terms of a, a website. Um, as I say, it's a partnership between the Food Institute at the University of Guelph and the library. I um, represent the library and I'm head of a team called Research Enterprise and Scholarly Communication. Our role at the university um, is to support research throughout the life cycle of research projects and so one of those forms of support is to promote um, the research accomplishments of the university. Um, I also wanted to mention that my wife is a communications officer with um, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, so I also have that, um, a little bit of exposure to that form of KTT as well. So the food map was launched just in November of last year, so it really is in its infancy. Um, I think in some ways, although it has a lot of value um, currently, it's also sort of a proof of concept that we're really just seeing this as a launching pad for, for further growth. Um, by way of illustrating what the food map is, I wanted to walk you through four um, illustrative case examples of how the food map can be used. So Jeff is an entrepreneur who owns greenhouses throughout Ontario. His business is suffering because of the short growing season. Jeff visits the food map and does a search for greenhouse vegetables. He finds an entry for strategies for extending the greenhouse vegetable growing season in Ontario. He contacts the lead researcher, Barry McAuliffe, and begins discussions on a partnership where research can inform his business practices. So again, here you'll see a, um, a brief abstract on that particular research project. Carla, Carla is a researcher 
on Ontario's wine industry. She has an interest in exploring how wineries can get more value from the byproducts of their production systems. Carla visits the food map and does a search for grapes. She finds an entry for grape pumice as a novel tool to treat insulin resistance and diabetes. She contacts David Wright, the lead researcher, and they discuss developing a research partnership. Raj is a reporter with the CBC. The popular media has raised concerns about giant ragweed and its impact on soybean production. Raj would like to contact an expert to ensure the public is better informed. Raj visits the food map and searches for giant ragweed. He finds that Peter Sekema and Joanne Fallings have conducted research in this area. What's more, their data is available for download. Raj contacts them both to see if he might interview them for the evening news. Fro's Food Company produces microwavable complete meals. They want to bring their customers a low-fat version of their usual stir-fry meal. They are considering reducing the fat within the chicken, but they are concerned about changing the texture of further, by further processing the meat. Searching the food map, there are several food science researchers studying food texture and fat content in meat products. Froze Food contacts one of the researchers, Shai Barbet, to talk about the possibilities of knowledge transfer. So that hopefully gives you some sense of the potential of the food map. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our strategy for populating the food map. Um, what we're doing is really identifying existing sources of data about food-related research and repurposing that data. This is supposed to give you a, a bit of a schematic representation about how various sources of data are being pulled into a central data store, um, being processed and then fed back out in the form of the food map. Um, one of our principles is that we don't want the onus to fall on researchers to populate a new system. There are so many redundant systems where they're every time they're applying for a grant or reporting on a project or sub submitting for their um, tenure review, populating the same information over and over again. So we wanted to just repurpose the information that already exists rather than asking them to populate a system. Um, another constraint is that we're really doing this without virtually any dedicated resources. So we don't have someone um, developing content, managing content. Again, we're just trying to repurpose content that already exists. So we need to identify sources of data. We harvest that data. We poll the data sources on a weekly basis, there, thereby um, ensuring that the data is up to date and, and relevant. So on a weekly basis, all the data sources are automatically polled. Any updates are pulled into the food map database that way. Um, we also link out, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, we link out to the scholarly articles um, as well as raw data that may be associated with the research projects. Um, so while the design of the system is to, as I say, repurpose existing data, there is also the opportunity for individual researchers, if they're the primary investigator, they can actually go in and update their entries if they, if they feel motivated to do so. I wanted to make a little bit of reference to the thesaurus that we use behind the scenes. This is the... USDA National Agricultural Library Thesaurus. So this is basically mapping out the entire field of agriculture and agri-food um, as a discipline. And we use the, these terminology and relationships between terms to enhance the searchability and retrievability of the entries in the food map, as well as to establish key research themes, um, priority themes for the food map. So I wanted to illustrate a couple of the um, linkages out from the food map that are, are very relevant. One is uh, a link to our data repository. So this particular entry features a link out to our uh, data repository. So this is actually where the raw data generated by the research projects is um, openly available to anyone who wants to gain access to the data and uh, 
they can, you can download the data, do your own analysis with the data. You could verify the results that the researcher came up with or use it for um, completely different purposes. Um, it uh, has full documentation on the methodology used to collect the data, any restrictions on how the data can be used. And I think this is another um, angle on transparency that we've been talking about um, when you're looking for to win trust from people, when you expose the actual raw data that informed your conclusions as a, as a researcher, that that's a, a higher level of, of transparency. Another thing that we link out to is our institutional repository, which is um, any scholarly output um, resulting from the research project. So these could be published articles, unpublished reports, research posters, presentations, ebooks, any, any form of scholarly output. We link out from the research descriptions to those um, scholarly outputs. This is an example just of a, um, a published paper with the full text available. Um, and I wanted to talk, the, this repository of scholarly outputs is um, an open access repository and I wanted to go on a little bit of a tangent and just talk a little bit about open access and, and why that matters. Um, the traditional um, scholarly communication paradigm involves researchers publishing in commercial scholarly journals where they not only um, lose their intellectual property rights to the, the, the content of their articles, but those articles then become locked behind um, very prohibitive um, subscription costs, which means public monies are used to fund research projects, but then the public has no access to the results of the research. Um, typically in the past, unless you're a member of an academic institution or a major research center, you have no access to the, to the products of, of the research. So this is just another way that the, the system has built walls around the ivory tower of academic research. So what open access does is it removes that, those scholarly outputs from that commercial paradigm and makes them openly available to anyone who wants to access them. Um, funders increasingly are mandating that when they give money to fund a research project, the products of that research have to be made openly available. The tri agencies just released, I think it was in February, a unified policy on open ac access of um, research outputs. In addition, um, to refer back to the data repository that I talked about a moment ago, um, they're also moving towards mandating that the raw data um, generated by research pro projects also has to be make made openly available to uh, who, anyone who wants to access it. Um, one of the other th um, things that this enables, one of the, uh, f the f um, important development at the University of Guelph is a focus on community engaged scholarship where the university researchers partner with members of the, the community to engage in, in research projects. So having these resources openly available is key to that as well as supporting things like citizen, science, citizen scientists. So that is pretty much all that I wanted to say. I wanted to hopefully give you some sense of what the food map is all about. Um, I will stress that we are very interested in growing and expanding in terms of more data in to be a, a more comprehensive tool in the coming months and years. Um, we have uh, handouts, if you haven't already grabbed one, I'd encourage you to take one of those and get in touch with us if you have any interest, either as a user of the food map or a partner that you would like to uh, engage with us. You know, we would be, uh, we'd be thrilled to hear from you. So I don't know if there's any... Uh, Comments or questions? It's really exciting uh, work, Wayne, and I was mentioning to David, I'm not sure how we can capitalize. Within the Canadian Nutrition Society, we have the benefit of people from multiple universities. Having you from a so social science background really uh, resonates with potential relative to NCE funding. But it, it makes me question where do our university boundaries lie, where do our other boundaries lie, how do we maintain uh, some control but be able to share for maximal good because clearly that would benefit everyone. 
Um, can you elaborate a bit well, in terms so of the boundaries? What? Well, does the University of Guelph own this, continue to own it? Uh, that would be my question. Or is it open access for all? Um, well, it's certainly open to everyone to gain access to this, but we're also very open to expanding this. We, we don't have a proprietary perspective on this at all, so we're looking for partners. There's some um, partnerships that we're currently in the process of negotiating, and ideally we would like to see this develop into a national or even international resource. Um, we don't have any desire to retain you know, University of Guelph identity or ownership of it in any way. Um, as I say, it's really a proof of concept, and we're quite open to see where this grows from here. Yeah. Uh, before my question, the last call we had with Ricky Yada and Wayne, the, Ricky is reaching out to a lot of deans and talking about this right now, and I don't know if you know the results of his conversations. Uh, well, we've we've been having a lot of um, challenges trying to connect with uh, UBC. So UBC is very interested in being a partner, not only the University of British Columbia, but also the provincial government in, B in BC. We've been having a lot of challenges just trying to schedule an opportunity for all of us to meet. But that's one of the um, key areas that Rick is focused on right now. You, you, you had examples of where an industry person would look, you know, they got an issue and stuff. How, how do you see this working in reverse, where you're uh, in an academic department, you don't have a Richardson Center to, to work out of, and how would you see that for the investigator, the academic, to try and get information from industry, including industry's interest in a food map? That's an interesting question because there, there are a lot of potential uses for the food map. Um, in addition to, I was really focused on how industry can ca connect with um, academic researchers, but there's also connecting academic researchers with each other. Um, there are, it's surprising actually that um, every one of our colleges is represented in the food map. When you think about food-related research, we certainly have a food science department, but there are many other departments, economics, um, anthropology, a lot of different disciplines that you wouldn't think of that are actually doing food-related research. So one of the other um, purposes or intentions of the food map is to connect researchers from different disciplines for, for interdisciplinary research projects. It also, in terms of the um, motivation of the institution itself, it plays a great role in recruitment, that recruiting faculty and grad students, um, when they see the, the nature and the quality of the research that's going on at the University of Guelph, that that's a, a recruitment tool in a sense. But to be honest, I haven't really thought through how as you say, this could be a tool for academic researchers to reach out to private industry. I will say that um, one of the other things that's on the agenda is to do more work in terms of um, scoping out where the product, where the food map should grow in terms of functionality and scope. So we want to be looking at um, conducting focus groups and that sort of thing to identify what additional functionality or information would make this a more useful product and you know one of the areas that I think is has a lot of potential is to expose more information about um, funding for research projects which currently isn't represented there at all. Thank you very much. Okay.